morning and welcome. Our first hymn this morning is 353, Old Victory in Jesus. Let's say and sing this together. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from the Lord. praise you for the victory that we can have in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the love uh, that you demonstrated to us while we were your enemies, that Jesus Christ came and suffered and died on the cross and rose again the third day, all to save sinners. We thank you, Lord, for the abilities that you have given to us as children of God so that in even in a small way this morning uh, we can glorify you even in a imperfect 
in our best efforts way. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to seek your face, that we would follow you no matter the cost. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that your son gave. Help us, Lord, to follow in his footsteps. We pray this morning that as we praise you, that we would have a heart ready to listen to your word, to follow your son, and to become more like him than we were yesterday. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So for our announcements this morning, Pastor O has um, started his vacation. Uh, he's going to be gone for about a week and a half. So he'll be gone this Sunday, uh, next um, Sunday, and this Wednesday. So he'll be back uh, the following Wednesday. So this morning, uh, Robbie will be preaching for us. Well, for our benefit, let's say it that way. For our scriptural benefit. Uh, he's always been a... Uh, blessing to me when he does come and preach, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I do want to uh, tell you about the good graduation we had on Friday. Um, Clarissa graduated, so congratulations to her. Um, but the testimonies that the both seniors gave were really um, glorifying to God and uh, showed a heart for the Lord, and that was the biggest blessing uh, for me as part of this academic ministry that we have. Um, continue to pray for both the church and the school, um, and um, seek what the Lord would have you to do in uh, the coming days. I think that'll do for the announcements. Our next hymn is 689, I Am So Glad That Jesus Loves Even Me, 689. <laughs> I'll read the first slide, and then you can read the, the next slide after that. Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem says, said, He has Beelzebub, and... By the ruler of the demons, he casts out the demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But has an end. No one can serve two masters, for 
wicked enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they said, he has an unclean spirit. Then, then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And the multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Amen. Mark 3, 35. Our next hymn is 284, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. 284. shepherd, you supply all our needs. And we will not want. Lord, oftentimes we see your blessings and overlook the giver and look at the gift. We pray, Lord, that you help us to prioritize the kingdom of God, that we would set our affections on things above, and not so easily set our eyes and our affections on the things that won't last things that rust, corrupt, or are stolen. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to set our hearts and our minds on the eternal rewards that you promise to those who follow you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn this morning is 638. Uh, 638, when uh, God asked Isaiah in the sixth chapter, who will go for us? Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. So we'll stand and sing 638. 
And as we stand, the junior church kids can be dismissed. today. Uh, as you already heard, Pastor is away on vacation, and the next two Sundays you do get the backups. Uh, we are glad to have the opportunity to share God's Word with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to have this opportunity, and it's humbling. And, uh, today in the Bible, if you could turn to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 is where we'll start. And let's go ahead and look to God in prayer before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for your provision in our lives. We do ask now during this time as we look into your word that you will help each one of us to see the truths there and apply them into our lives, that we can live and be more like Christ. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now imagine that you're holding a cup of coffee and somebody bumps into you causing you to spill your cup. Now, you didn't spill tea. You didn't spill grape juice or soda. You spilled coffee. Because coffee is what was in your cup. Now, if you had tea in your cup, you would have spilled tea, right? But the point of this is, whatever's inside your cup is going to spill when your cup is bumped or shaken. Now, as Christians, we are all vessels, not unlike a cup. Now, looking from the outside, no one can tell what we contain on our inside. But when events come our way and bump against us or shake us up a little bit, you can see what comes out. We must ask ourselves, what's in my cup? Is it love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control? Or is it anger, bitterness, anxiety, impatience, mean-spiritedness, ill will, faithlessness, harshness, and a lack of discipline? Now we might present to the world that we are full of one thing, but really we're full of another. It's easy to fake it when nothing's bumping into us or shaking us up. But when a little trial, a little temptation comes our way, 
irritation, conflict, inconvenience, any of these things come our way and you can see what's inside will come spilling out. So in our lives, we need to examine and see, is our inside matching what we present on our outside? Is our cup actually full of what we say it's full of? Now let's say an unsaved person were to come and, and ask you this question. What is Jesus like? What is Jesus like? Would you be able to say that Jesus is like me? Or would you be embarrassed to even think that? How could Christ be like me? I'm a sinner. Well, yes, we all are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But in our passage in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, Galatians 5, starting at verse 16, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We'll stop there. Now we see here in the beginning in verse 16 the command it says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk. This is a continual action. It's our lifestyle. Here Paul's writing this that we need to have a lifestyle of walking in the spirit. The spirit should lead us in our life. Following the spirit's leading. It implies progress in our life. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're moving in a certain direction. You're walking in a certain line. You're not swaying back and forth. You're going toward a goal. And it says that when we're doing that, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, a lust is a strong desire. And the flesh, now this refers to our old desires we followed when we were unsaved. When we were unsaved, we gave in to whatever pleasure that came our way. We wanted, we went, right? Um, that's, the, that's the unsaved life. When something comes your way and you want it, you go for it. It's kind of how our advertising goes these days in America, right? Oh, you, you really want this, right? And they, and they portray that you need it, you want it, go get it. Get what makes you happy, right? And that, that's what the world wants, but that's not what God tells us to do. He doesn't say go after this, go after that. He says go after the Holy Spirit. Now think about being led by the Spirit. When you were a child, you probably played this game called Follow the Leader. Right? And the leader did something, you had to do exactly what the leader did. They hop, you hop, right? They walk backwards, you walk backwards. Well, think about it that way with the Spirit. The Spirit wants us to do something, we should do exactly what the Spirit tells us to do. You know, we have the love, joy, peace, right? We should do exactly what the Spirit tells us. Or teens and adults, we don't play that game anymore, but we, uh, we get on social media and we follow influencers. Mm -hmm. and we follow exactly what they do. The newest challenge out there, right? We do that challenge. Or an influencer starts doing this, or they eat at this restaurant, well, we're gonna go there. They dress like this, we're gonna dress like that, right? And that's what we do as Christians sometimes. We follow the wrong things. We're following these worldly influencers when we should be following our Holy Spirit, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the one that's our leader. It's not always wrong to do some of those things. They're fun and all, sometimes. Sometimes they're sinful, but we aren't following who we should follow. We get our focus in the wrong spot. Because he says, once again, when you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So our focus is important. And then in verse 19, 
uh, he starts talking about what the works of the flesh are. You know, I'm not going to go into great detail on this. I'm going to focus more on the fruit of the Spirit today. But let's look at them briefly. It says, The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Now, these are a lot of sins that have to do with sexual sins. Things that are rampant in our world. They are actually, you know, looked highly upon in some circles. You know, when you're able to do some of these things, people will congratulate you. It, it, it's in our society it, it's kind of twisted and backwards sometimes but as believers these shouldn't even be named among us then we have idolatry you know idolatry that well is that rampant in our country i don't see a lot of people worshiping statues well true but we worship a lot of other things in our country worshiping power possessions money fame all these different things people are just worshiping themselves idolatry is rampant sorcery now this isn't necessarily talking about magicians and that. Sorcery is also talking about drug use. Using drugs, illicit drugs to get in an altered state of mind. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things we should not have in our life. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. I mean, just go driving on the highway sometime, you're going to see all these going on. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of wrong going on out there. Selfish ambitions. People just want what they want, right? And they, they go after what they want. They don't care who they step on. Their ambition is very selfish. Dissensions, heresies. Yes, people are just speaking on whatever gets the crowd in. And you see, you know, whether it causes dissension, they don't care. If it's against what God's word says, well, that's okay. God's loving and he'll forgive me for it, right? People think they can just preach whatever they want. They don't preach the Bible 100% anymore. Envy, murders, I mean, we know abortion is justified in this country, right? Murder every day. Drunkenness. You know, there's a lot of Christians now that they, well, I'm going to drink now. Yeah, I might get a little tipsy, but I'm not drunk drunk, right? I'm just a little drunk. Well, drunkenness is wrong according to the Bible. We are not supposed to get there. Revelries, wild parties and the like, right? All of these things, Paul said, I've warned you against these things, right? And we shouldn't have these in our lives. We need to battle them, right? They're against the flesh. The flesh and the spirit battle. And battles are difficult. Battles aren't easy. And is it hard to battle against sin? It is. Because your natural flesh wants this. And it's hard at every point of your life. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, young people, they, they battle against that, you know, peer pressure. And it's tough. It is tough when you're young. But we do the same when we're a little older. We're around friends our age and they're doing something, well, there's pure pressure. And the pressure to do wrong, it, it, it's there, it's real. And we need to fight against these things. You know, it says that those who practice such things, in verse 21, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, practice isn't a one-time thing. This is somebody that's their lifestyle. Somebody that this is their lifestyle, they will not inherit the kingdom of God because they're not, they're not for God. They're for this, these sins. But as believers, sometimes we get focused too much on these sins. And what I mean by that, we think if I could stop these sins and get all these bad things out of my life, then I'm spiritual. Then God will love me. That's not true. We get it backwards. We forget the Bible doesn't tell us just to put off our old nature. It tells us then also to put on. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says this, <coughs> that if you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. So verse 16 once again says, I said then walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Once again, we, we get it backwards. It doesn't say get rid of the flesh, then you'll walk in the spirit. When we actively walk in the spirit, the flesh will be going away. Because we're going to be living like Christ. And when you live like Christ, the old deeds pass away. They go away. We can't fight those old deeds on our own. We need the spirit's help. We need to walk in him in order to to become more like Christ. Don't get it backwards. You can't put off all these things without putting on. And here, you put it on, the old things go away. 
And that's, that's what, what God is telling us when we're active in this. Now, getting into the fruit of the Spirit, many of them overlap. They have some differences, but love is the first one. Love is the supreme virtue of Christian living. Love. The Bible says that God is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is a, it reflects a personal choice. You know, in, in our, our world today, love is a very convoluted definition. It's not pleasant emotions. It's not warm, fuzzy feelings, right? It's a willing, self-giving service and sacrifice. I mean, it's when we give of ourselves, and it's not a selfish thing. It's to, for others' benefit. And you are willing to serve and sacrifice for other people. That's what love is. That's the expression of love. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Here, Jesus told us, love you got to love God with everything and love your neighbor with everything. Mm -hmm. Serve and sacrifice for your God. Serve and sacrifice for your neighbor, for your fellow person. That's what love truly is. And God was very loving, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate sacrifice. Were we worthy of him dying for us? No, we didn't do anything to impress God. He says, why were we yet sinners? While we were out actively sinning against our God, he still sent his son to die for us. Mm -hmm. Now that's amazing love. That is big. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You know, if we love people, we should be willing to sacrifice even our life for them. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? You know, sometimes we think, I have this love great enough, I'm going to sacrifice my life for my fellow believers. But then when someone has a need, we fail to, to give. We don't help them when they're in need. I'll die for them, but I'm not going to give them any money. Come on, right? Sometimes we do this. How does, our, how does God's love abide in us if we're not willing to give them when they're in need? We might think, yeah, when it comes down to it, I'll, I'll sacrifice myself. I'll, I'll lay down my life for, for the church, for the people, for, for God, for everyone. But when there's a need, we're not willing to give from what God has given us already for that person. And, and that's something to look at. We need to make sure, are we loving biblically? Are we loving the way that God has told us to? A newspaper columnist and minister, George Crane, tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be as kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no effort to, to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. After you've convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. With a revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, Beautiful, beautiful! He will he ever be surprised. And after she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if, for too much, she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, sharing. When she didn't return, Crane called. Are you ready now to go through with the divorce? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as often repeating deeds. John 14, 15 says, if you love me... Keep my commandments. You know, the expression, talk is cheap. We can say we love God, we can say we love people, but if there's no action behind it, 
what good is it? God here just specifically says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Are we following God? Now, I'm pretty sure if we say we're a Christian, we'd say, yeah, I love God. I love God. But are we living for him? Are we following him? Are we showing him? And the, in that story I just told, as you act upon it and do it and put it in the, the feelings come, the, the emotions come, love comes. You know, sometimes you feel like, I love God, but I don't, you know, I have this, well, it's not about feelings, remember, it's about self-sacrifice. It's about giving of yourself. And all that comes as you do it. All, and your mind starts changing. But you have to put it into practice. Our next fruit is joy. Joy is a deep down sense of well-being that you know all is well between yourself and the Lord. Not only when things are going well, but in difficult times, too. It's not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances, not even a, from human emotion, but it's divinely stimulated. It is God's gift to believers, joy. Nehemiah 8.10 Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. 1 Peter 1.8 Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. This joy needs to be a part of our life. John 16, verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Your sorrow will be turned into joy. Joy is something that needs to be part of our lives. Things come our way. It's not happiness. Happiness is determined on your circumstances. But joy is something that you have deep down. You trust God. You know he's going to do what's best in your life. And you have that inner peace and happiness in him, not in your circumstances. A story is told of a Russian countess who accepted the Lord Jesus as her Savior and was open about her testimony. The Tsar was displeased and threw her into prison. After 24 hours with the lowest level of Russian society and the most miserable conditions imaginable, he ordered her brought into his presence. He smiled and said, Well, are you ready now to renounce your silly faith and come back to the pleasures of the court? To his surprise, the countess smiled serenely and said, I have known more real joy and more real happiness in one day in prison with Jesus than I've known in a lifetime in the courts of the Tsar. She found out what was really the easy way. Joy is really in the Lord. It's not in anything else. How many famous rich people have we seen commit suicide or get hooked on drugs? Or they just get involved in all these wicked things because there's no happiness in their fame and fortune. They are missing where true joy comes from. And it comes from the Lord. James 1, 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Joy. We are supposed to be joyful even when trials come, because God is working in you, working patience, making you complete. So when problems come your way, yeah, our first reaction, yes, no, the problem, right? Well, we, we might not jump up and down, but we should be thanking the Lord, saying, you know what, God, you care about me. You're trying to do something for me. Uh, when I used to play football in high school, my coach would yell at me sometimes. Nowadays, you, you yell at someone playing sports and they cry and it's over. But um, when I played, the coaches yelled a lot at me. And it was, I mean, and my coach told me, you know why I'm yelling at you? Because I care about you. I know that you're better than this. If I said nothing, that shows that I didn't care about you. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I see what he did, because he, he expected more out of me, so he was getting on me. And the next play, you know, I would do much better. Well, God thankfully doesn't yell at us, but God brings trials our way. And when trials are coming your way, you should say, well, thank you, Lord, you care about me. You're trying to change me. If you're going through life and life's so easy, there's no trials. Well, 
There, there should be. There will be. Uh, just remember, when God cares about you, he's going to help you become more like him. And trials is a big part of that. Because he needs to change us. He needs to mold us into what we're supposed to be. The next fruit of the Spirit is peace. Peace refers to the tranquility of mind that comes from your relationship with God. Peace has everything to do with binding together. It's reflected in the modern expression, having it all together. Everything is in its place as it ought to be. And that's in God, not in our own strength. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus is leaving his peace with us. We need to have his peace. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When we're able to have this peace, God has given this to us, where we have this peace of mind. We don't have all this worry and anxiety because we know God is in control. And we're at peace with that. And we know he's going to do his plan, his work. In a study done by Duke University on peace of mind, factors found to contribute greatly to emotional and mental stability are this. Number one, the absence of suspicion and resentment. So nursing a grudge was a major factor in unhappiness. Makes sense, right? If you're have a grudge against someone, you're probably going to be unhappy. Number two, living, not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures leads to depression. Why should we focus on the past and our old mistakes? Right? Sinful things. Does God forgive us of our sins? Yes. Does he wash them under the blood when we ask forgiveness? Yes. We, we need to keep bringing, quit bringing them back to our minds because that can lead to depression. Three, not wasting time and energy fighting the conditions you cannot change. Cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it. So when something comes your way, you've got to realize God's the one in control. He brought that circumstance into my life. I can't run away from it. Like Jonah tried to run away, right? When God brings something your way, don't run away from it. Go through the situation looking for God, what he wants you to grow and change in that situation. Number four, force yourself to stay involved and in the, with the living world. Resist the temptation to withdraw and become reclusive during periods of emotional stress. Yeah, when difficult things come our way, a lot of times we just want to go be alone. We want to go uh, surf the internet or just turn on the TV or movie and just get lost in music, whatever it is, right? We just want to go and just let our mind go. But really, we need to go and be with people. When we're going through stress, we need to be around God's people and that will be helpful to us. Five, refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Accept the fact that nobody gets through life without some sorrow and misfortune. Right? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? That's what they say. But when God brings you a tough situation, that's the whole point. What does God want us to learn from this? How does he want me to grow? Seven, do not expect too much of yourself. When there's too wide a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet the goals you have set, Feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. What, I guess what I get from this spiritually is don't set goals that are beyond what God wants you to do. You know, you don't have to be the greatest preacher in the world, or you don't have to you know, evangelize the whole world. Well, just evangelize the next person God brings your way. Set realistic goals in God. And then here's the eighth one, the final one. This is really amazing. This is a secular university. Listen to this. Find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Self-centered, egotistical people score lowest in any test for measuring happiness. So as Christians, I, I think we have something bigger than ourselves to believe in. We have our God and Father. We have the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. We have the three in one. We have something great to believe in. And that is important because it says self-centered, egotistical people score the lowest on any measuring of happiness. When we're self-centered, we will be miserable. We need to really pour ourselves into our Lord and Savior, our Creator. That's what God has made us for. Next we have long-suffering. Long-suffering is a synonym for patience. This is enduring injuries inflicted by others. A calm willingness to accept situations that are irritating or painful. 
1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God has been very patient with us. Remember, he sent his son to die for us while we were yet sinners. And when we do wrong, he's still patient. He wants us to come around. He doesn't want us to perish. God shows that patience. But yet, it's tough sometimes to show patience. Um, I have three young children at home. And those of you that have raised children, sometimes they test your patience, don't they? And it gets, it's difficult at times. But God can give you that patience. If you commute to work, you must have patience on the roadways. Mm -hmm. It's difficult at times to drive through traffic. When someone cuts you off or is driving erratically, it's tough to be patient with them. But God wants us to be patient. Maybe there's somebody in your life. They just, they know how to push your buttons, right? Even if they're not trying to, they push your buttons. You have to learn to be patient with them. Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which with you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering bearing with one another in love. We need to be long-suffering with one another, patient. And once again, some of those uh, lusts of the flesh had to do with fighting and contentions. Well, when we're long-suffering and patient with people, that will be gone. We're not going to be fighting with them. We're not going to be envious of them. We're patient with them. Then we hit kindness. Kindness relates to tender concern for others. A genuine desire of a believer to treat others gently, just as the Lord treats him. 2 Timothy 2.24 And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach patience. Luke 6.31, the golden rule. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And I went to a public school growing up, elementary school, and we had the golden rule on. They didn't say it was from the Bible, but that's where it came from. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you, right? Many of you have heard this. That's kindness. We should be kind to others, right? Because we should want them to be kind back, hopefully. We should be kind. Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Kindness. This is something that we all can work on in our lives. How can I be kind? You can say a kind word. You can do a deed for somebody that's kind. Kindness is looking out for other people's needs instead of your own. Selfishness and kindness, they don't go together. When you're selfish, you're not being kind to people. You're being kind to yourself, maybe. But we need to really think about other people and how our kindness can be given to them. Then we have goodness. Goodness is moral and spiritual excellence that is known by its sweetness and kindness. So this has to do with kindness. Sweetness, you know, being a good person in the Lord. Romans 5 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone will even dare to die. You know, the upright person who has goodness is much more likely to have self sacrificing friends. This isn't just talking about somebody that checks all the marks and, wow, they must be super holy because they don't sin and do all this. We're not talking just that, we're talking more than that. This is a good person that's good to people that treats people with kindness and respect, that has close friends. Because when you have a close friend and you show goodness, people are willing to sacrifice for you because they see the goodness coming out of your life. It's something that, that spills out of you. Uh, in the Bible, Joseph was like this. Matthew 1.19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a good man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. And when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, he could have, I mean, publicly shamed her, made, a, made an example out of her. But he was a good man and said, Justin, he didn't want to do that to her. He didn't think that was right. And he didn't, and obviously God showed him why she had a baby, and it was from the Holy Spirit. And But God knew, not just Mary, but he knew what kind of man Joseph was. He put them both in this spot for a reason. And he was a good man. Galatians 6.10 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. We're supposed to do good to all, but especially believers. Are we good to other believers? Are we looking out for their good? Are we treating them in a way that we would say is good? Do we care about those that are in the house of the Lord with us? Do we care about other believers? Are we good to them? That, that's a challenge to think about. Faithfulness. Uh, this is loyalty and trustworthiness. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is very faithful. That's a, a great attribute. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. We need to be faithful as believers. We need to follow through on what God's given us. Every task that he gives us, we need to complete. We need to be faithful in our time with him. We need to be faithful in our prayer life. We need to be faithful in our church attendance. We need to be faithful in how we meet the needs of others. God has given us this fruit to be part of our lives. Gentleness, uh, which could be called meekness. The humble and gentle attitude that is patiently submissive in every offense. While being free of any desire for revenge or retribution. We need to be gentle. Uh, the Greek word uh, is used three times in the New Testament for different things. One is a, submissive, a submissiveness to the will of God. So gentle, meek people, they're going to submit to God's will in every circumstance. Teachableness. This is where it's tough sometimes because when somebody comes to you and wants to help you learn something, instead of being teachable, we get defensive. Right? We don't want to hear it. We're like, wait. And we try to defend ourselves before we even hear what they're saying. And also a consideration of others. When you're gentle and meek, you're going to consider other people's needs before your own. You're going to think about what do other people need, not just myself. First, uh, sorry, First Timothy 6.11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. It's important that we put this fruit in our lives, too. Self-control is restraining passions and appetites. 1 Corinthians 9.25, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. Now we've seen the stories of the Olympics. I love watching the Olympics. And they always have those little stories, right, about how this athlete, they train for years. They have special diets. They go to special places to train. I've been even seen in other countries. People see their kids, you know, they're three years old, they do a somersault. Okay, we're sending them off to gymnastics camp for years to be in the Olympics. And they barely see their children. And these kids, they have self-control in their lives. I mean, sometimes it's a bit extreme, but they have this self-control because they have a goal. What is their goal? The gold medal. They want the gold medal, right? They want to get a medal in the Olympics, and they, they are willing to eat a certain food. They are willing to sleep at certain times. They're willing to give them all these freedoms because they want to obtain something. They want to obtain a perishable crown want to obtain a medal. Believers, wow, don't we have something to obtain? We do, right? Eternal treasures in heaven, God has promised. That's why we need to implement self-control in our lives. Are we willing to give up freedoms that we have in order to follow after Christ? You know, he's the author and finisher of our faith. We need to strive after him. 1 Peter 5, uh, 1, 5 through 6. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness. There is, again, self-control. We need to learn how to be self-controlled, to follow after Christ. It's a lot easier to be self-controlled when you realize why you are controlling yourself. Because it's for God. Not for yourself, not for anything else. You're doing it for God. And then once we're able to implement all of these... We look after the fruit of the Spirit in verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, 
Let us also walk in the Spirit. The flesh should not rule over our lives. It's been crucified. You know, just like when you chop the head off a chicken, it does run around a little bit, right? And it, it still has some nerve endings and things, and it, it's still active. Well, yeah, our flesh is still a little bit active. We've crucified it, but it's still there. It's still trying to make its way, but its head's gone. Its head's gone. Our flesh needs to be battled against until it's finally defeated. And one day we will be with the Lord in heaven, free of sin, but we are supposed to be fighting every day to be more and more like Christ. So the challenge to everyone, we need to walk in the Spirit. And what is the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit. The challenge is, everyone, I, I, I started doing this, I heard someone on a, on a podcast talk about this, that you take one fruit each week and pray for that fruit. Pray that you'll make that part of your life. So for a week, you'll pray about love. And every day you think about, how can I demonstrate love in my life? What can I do to love? And the next week would be you know, joy. And you take that and you, you think about it throughout the day. How can I love people? How can I love God? And you start putting it into practice. And that's a way to get the fruit of the Spirit in your life. This fruit will grow, and you'll be able to say, yeah, Jesus is like me, because I am like him. Philippians 3.17, here, listen to what Paul said. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have for us a pattern. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. So at the beginning, maybe you thought, well, why would you say Christ is like me? Isn't that a little proud, a little arrogant? Well, Paul, who said he was the chief of sinners, is saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We need to make sure that we are imitating Christ so when others look at us, they see Christ in us. Because I've heard it said by many preachers, you might be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. When they hear you're a Christian, they might think, that's what Christ is like, like you. Would you be embarrassed if someone thought Christ was just like you? Or would you say, you know, I'm doing my best to follow him, and hopefully they're seeing some positive things in my life that are Christ. That's where we have to think about ourselves. You know, we must keep growing. We must keep growing. Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. We press on as Christians. We're not there yet. Paul... Like I said, he called himself the chief of sinners. But yet, he wrote much of the New Testament. He even said, imitate me. Paul knew he was following Christ the best he could, but he realized how sinful he still was. That's why he was following Christ so closely. Sometimes when we think we're pretty good with sin, that's when it's really seeping into your life undetected. Because we're getting kind of proud and arrogant. We think we've accomplished something when we haven't. This fruit must continually be coming out of our lives, not just a one-time thing. I mean, imagine having an apple tree. You plant that apple tree, you water that apple tree, and you get a harvest of apples. You're really excited, right? When you're making apple pie, apple this, apple that, giving them away to your friends. The next season, you come out, beautiful tree, no apples. Next season, no apples, no apples. Now, would that still be a good apple tree? Well, it might be a nice tree with some shade and stuff, but if there's no apples, it's no longer an apple tree. It's not producing what it was made for. As believers, we can't just say, yeah, I, I, loved, I loved somebody that one time. I had joy in my life when I went through that trial in the past. We can't just look at the past. We need to look and press forward to the future. God wants this fruit of the Spirit to continually come out of our lives every single day. Every single moment of every single day, we need to be thinking about how can I live and follow Christ? That's what we need to have in our mind. And how do we get this power? John 15, 4 through 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. There is no power unless we abide in God. We need to spend time in His Word. We need to learn more and more from the Scriptures. We need to let it become 
just a part of our life that's flowing through us at all times because we can't do it in our own strength. Remember, let us walk in the Spirit as we live lives worthy of, as believers. Walk in the Spirit. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. We need to walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. Then you will be able to say, Jesus is like me because I am like him. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. This is something that should be pouring out of our lives every time something bumps into us. People need to see not an outside Christian, but they need to see what's inside of us pouring out into the lives of others. All of these, the fruit of the Spirit, need to be flowing from our lives as Jesus Christ is flowing into us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your word, and we pray that you will give us strength. Please help each of us to just take your scriptures that we heard today and apply them into our lives. Please help us to show the fruit of the Spirit. And when difficulties come, please help us to put you first and love you with everything that we have and then love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray all this in Christ's name.